Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. Today we are going to dive into a man who is a seems to be a social and political commentator, Konstantin Kissin. I hope I'm saying his name correctly. Uh, as you can probably tell from the title, this will be my first time watching him. And I'm actually not familiar with him at all, but from what I've seen online, he's a he's relatively popular. Uh, and so here we go. This is going to be my first encounter with Konstantin. Hello and thank you. Alexander Solzhenitsyn once said that the strength or weakness of a society depends more on the level of its spiritual life than on its level of industrialization. If a nation's spiritual energies have been exhausted, he said, it will not be saved from collapse by the most perfect government structure or by any industrial development. A tree with a rotten core cannot stand. Mm. When he was allowed to leave the USSR, Solzhenitsyn went to the US, where he was given a hero's welcome. But he quickly realized that American society was far from perfect. He started lecturing Americans about the problems he saw. Americans don't like that. <laughs> like Solzhenitsyn, I come from the Soviet Union, but I have no intention of repeating his mistake. That's why I've come to Britain. <laughs> It's funny too. Where you love being told what's wrong with you by foreigners. <laughs> but I do have to be honest. Six months ago when Jordan and Philippa asked me to come here and speak at ARC about the importance of audacity, adventure, and a positive vision for our civilization, I was honored and delighted. But as I stand here today, after watching crowds openly celebrate mass murder on the streets of our cities, Mm. After watching the police spend more time debating Islamic theology on Twitter than enforcing the law, I'm starting to lose faith. I don't know how long our civilization will survive. For years now, many of us have been warning that the barbarians are at the gates. We were wrong. They're inside. Now, look, I'm not going to be all doom and gloom. There are positives as well. I mean, say what you want about Hamas supporters. At least they know what a woman is. <laughs> I can already tell what kind of commentator he is. I might end up like it. Let's see, let's see. But joking aside, I have to be honest, I've been in a dark place these last few weeks. So I did what I always do when I don't know what to do. I talk to my wife. It's not the only time I talk to her, but you don't get the point. <laughs> and she said, look, you just, you need, a, you need to clear your mind, take a few days off. Let's go on holiday. And I know it's a weird thing to say, I don't like going on holiday. Because I love working and I hate spending money. Amen. Amen to that. I always thought I was the one with the problem. Don't get me wrong, I like a good vacation. But the older I get, there's just something about taking five days off. And everybody builds vacations as just go, uh, a, an escape getaway and forget about things. But I don't want to forget about things because... Like, I'm busy, right? And it feels like you're just losing time. It's just, I'm glad to know I'm not the only one with that issue, though. You know? Protestant work ethic in a Jewish man's body. <laughs> My wife is exactly the other way around, unfortunately. <laughs> but she was right. She's always right. That's her best and most annoying quality. Um, so we went to Barcelona, beautiful city. And as we were walking down the main tourist street, La Rambla, many of you will know when you get to the bottom, you hit the Christopher Columbus monument. And it looks like a giant column with a pillar of Columbus on top pointing towards the new world. And this reminded me of my son, Nikolai. He's 16 months and this is what he does. He sits on my hip uh, and points in the direction he wants to go. <laughs> Treats me like a horse, basically. <laughs> and if I don't act quickly enough or if I don't comply, he does what all toddlers do. He throws a tantrum and starts screaming, how dare you? You have stolen my dreams with your empty words. <laughs> and when he does, we read him a story and put him to bed. We don't give him a standing ovation in front of the UN. Anyway, trigger warning, I am going to talk positively about Christopher Columbus. Uh-oh. I know uh -oh. he committed some pretty sizable microaggressions. 
but he also changed the world. Do you know why he changed the world? Yeah, he tried to reach India and by accident discovered America. But why go west to India? Europeans had been trading with India and China for centuries via mm. the Silk Road. Why risk your life to go out on a limb? There were many reasons, of course, but the main one was the decision to try and reach Asia by going west was not made out of choice. Europe was desperate. Only a few decades prior, in 1453, the Ottomans sacked Constantinople and they cut Europe off from the mm. Silk Road. The West was facing a huge challenge and a new threat, no smaller than the one we face today. And like us, what they needed was another way. But when Columbus took his idea to go west to India to the kings and queens of medieval Europe, they laughed at him. They didn't laugh at him because he was some misunderstood genius. He wasn't Galileo. They laughed at him because he was wrong. If you go out in the street and ask a random person why Columbus discovered America, they'll tell you he worked out that the Earth was round. Not true. By the time Columbus set off on his voyage in 1492, people had known the Earth was round for two millennia. Mm. There's probably more flat Earthers now than there were in the 15th century. <laughs> That, God bless that, the internet. That, the, hey, there's a lot of, and every other day, and it's not like I watch these things, so the algorithm is a bit weird, but every other day I'm seeing videos about flat earth, and it's not something I've dove into, so I'm going to excuse myself from making any any claims. I know it's widely accepted that the earth is round, so once again, I'm going to excuse myself from that, but yeah, that, that's pretty much the accepted theory, but I'm seeing a lot more of, flat earthers, so I don't know, maybe I need to look into it in the future, right? The reason Columbus discovered America is not that he'd worked out that the Earth was round. The reason is that he massively underestimated the size of the planet. They were right to laugh at him. He was wrong. But he took that wrongness, he persuaded 90 other men to get into three boats smaller than the size of this stage and sail into the unknown. And he persuaded Queen Isabella of Castile and King Ferdinand of Aragon to fund his voyage. The moral of the story is, it doesn't matter how wrong you are, as long as you've got rich friends. <laughs> That's not the moral of the story. The moral of the story is, the history of our civilization was not made by people who always got everything right. It was made mm. by people who'd made mistakes too. It was made by people who dared to believe that they could solve the problems they faced. The story of the West is a story of audacity. The big debates of the last decade, the culture war, the polarization, are about one thing and one thing only, the future. There are people like us in this room who believe that our future is to be prosperous, powerful, and influential. We are the majority. But there are also some people whose brains have been broken by an excess of education, who believe that our history is evil, that we do not deserve to be great, we do not deserve to be powerful, that we must be punished for the sins of our ancestors. Yep. To them, our past is abominable, abominable, our present must be spent apologizing, and our future is managed decline. My message to those people is simple. How dare you? You will not steal my son's dreams with your empty words. I don't know if he was intentionally alluding to what's that little Swedish girl uh, that gave that speech at the, I think it was at the UN. The how dare you girl. I forget her name, but yeah, the annoying one. I don't know if that's a, a, a little jab at her, but I hope it is. But Jordan is right. We need a positive message too, so here it is. From the dawn of time, human beings have had to work to make the world a better place. We captured the mystery of fire. We invented the wheel. Today, we build buildings that would shock and awe almost every human being that has ever lived. We split the atom, we spliced the genome, and we connected the world through microcomputers that fit in our pockets, that allow us to do amazing things. This morning, I destroyed someone on Twitter with facts and logic from the toilet. It's magic. <laughs> Remember your grandparents? Remember them? 
If I could go back in time and transport the grandparents of your grandparents into this room, just four generations ago, they would think they'd been abducted by aliens. That's the progress we've made. We haven't made that progress by whining and acting like victims. Mm. We've made that progress by unleashing the creativity and talent of people like us here in this room. But I do think we've forgotten what adventure is. Being adventurous is not ordering extra spicy chicken at Nando's. It could be. Wrong reference for this room. Uh, <laughs> let me try again. Being adventurous is not ordering extra spicy chicken from your personal chef. Oh, that was a posh shot, huh? When Columbus and his men got on those boats and took a journey into the unknown, they sailed to certain death. You know why? It's not because they were braver than you and I. It's because they knew something we've forgotten. All death is certain. Mm. And so I say to our friends in the world of business, you've made your fortunes by maximizing your returns on your investments. We are in the fight of our lives. There is no greater return on your investment than to protect and preserve our civilization. And so I invite you to follow in the footsteps of Elon Musk and Paul Marshall and Bandello and many of you here who are using your fortunes for the betterment of humanity. I say to our friends in the media, truth matters. We are in the fight of our lives. There is more to life than clicks and downloads. Let's move beyond the culture war where all we do is bat away the litany of slanderous allegations about our history. Let's set the agenda. Let's remind our fellow citizens why we are where we are. Let's remind them that we are the most tolerant, open, and welcoming societies mm. in the history of the world. We're not embarrassed about our past. We're proud of it. And to my colleagues in new media especially, I say this. The legacy media is dying for a reason. 100%. They cannot be saved. They cannot be reformed. Absolutely. Let's stop complaining about them Absolutely. and start building the media empires of the future ourselves. We have everything we need. We've even got rich friends now. <laughs> I say to our friends in education and academia, I understand that many of you feel like the French resistance or Soviet partisans, stuck behind enemy lines, undermanned and outgunned. And you're right, we are in the fight of our lives. So keep fighting for every young mind you can. It will be worth it. That's the battle. That, that's, that right there is what the elites, the so-called elites, are all fighting for. It's the battle, the war for the minds of the youth. Because they will be the ones that, for good or for bad, for intentionally or unintentionally, will impact the future of the world. Because they are the future. When I was younger, they used to always tell us, the teachers would say, you are the future of this country. And... If I had the brain that I have now, the awareness that I have now, I would have looked at it and looked around the room and said, Jesus, this is this is the future of our country. Even me, I would have looked at myself, I'm the future of, of this country. And that's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. That's why whenever you get a, a public figure or political leader that can take, I don't want to say take control, but take control of the influence of the minds of the youth, they become either an asset for the elites or a weapon against them. So it, it all depends on what kind of feedback, what kind of treatment and criticism a figure receives. Because if it's negative from the top, that might, that might tell you something about the person. But I digress. And finally, I say to our friends in politics, many of you here are conservatives. I'm not. I look terrible in tweed. That's why I identify as politically non-binary. Um, <laughs> but I can tell you conservatives something. You will never get young people to want to conserve a society and an economy that is not working for them. Wow. We will not overcome wow. woke nihilism as long as young people are locked out of the housing market, unable to pair up, unable to have kids, wow. unable to plan for the future.
I know it's difficult, and I know that whoever solves the housing crisis may well pay the price at the ballot box. This is true of many pressing issues too, or at least you think it is. But you did not get into politics to get re-elected. Oh. You got into politics to make a difference. Abs. Yes. Yes. We are in the fight of our lives. And if courage means anything, it means doing the right thing and being willing to take the punishment if you have to. Let me say it again. All death is certain. We do not get to choose whether we live or die. We only get to choose whether we live before we die. Thank you very much. Oh. Whoa, 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 whoa. And just like that, Constantine, right? Am I saying Constantine becomes somebody that is now on my radar and somebody that I'm going to be looking into for the next few weeks and, and then on. I mean, where do I start? This was, first of all, I like the title of the video, the speech that the world needs to hear. Let me tell you something. He is spot on. And the last two to three minutes of his speech were just, I mean, it, it almost blew me away. I think there's a trend happening because he's correct. For the longest time, conservatives, even in America, have had a difficult time at grasping the attention of the youth. In America, at least, the conservatives have always focused on the economy, which is important. You know, speaking about GDP and inflation rates and you know, the World Economic Forum and, and, and the, the Federal Reserve and all of these things are probably the most important topics that we can discuss. But when you're trying to reach an 18, 19, 20, 22 year old, they're more concerned about booze and TikTok and, 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 and the, co the culture in America for the past, I want to say 20 years has been co-opted by the by the left by the progressive by the far left so while conservatives were focusing on newspaper ads and even television ads and billboard ads the democrats were sneaking into tiktok and paying influencers to push their agenda and that's what worked the best because that influencer that 16 year old 18 year old 19 year old idiot on social media who does weird dances for a living he or she has an, an insurmountable influence on the youth, much more than you can even measure as a politician. So while conservatives were discussing the real issues in America, the left was inserting themselves and their ideologies into the school system, into the education system. Now you have a direct one-on-one -on -one influence on the youth, and you can control and adapt and warp their minds to what you want them to think. And then we wonder why college students are coming out dumber than they went in with blue hair and 16 nose piercings. Then you wonder why Columbia students, Yale students, Harvard students, some of the most elite Ivy League schools that we have in America and in the world, why they're stuck outside with turbans on their face, protesting, burning shit down, screaming these good for nothing protest chants, taking the schools hostage, fighting police, you wonder why the youth is at the point of no return, of destruction. And the writing's on the wall. I think he said in the beginning of the speech, he said, I'm losing faith in our world. I would imagine he's speaking of the Western world. I look around and even at my ripe, I shouldn't say ripe, I should say young age of 27, I'm, I'm beginning to lose hope in my own generation because I have direct I have direct experiences with them, interactions with them. And it doesn't seem too hopeful on my end either. But in America, at least, I think it's changing. Because for the past four years of the Joe Biden presidency, it has been bad. And it got bad very, very quickly. The economy hit a downturn. Social issues hit a downturn. Uh, foreign affairs hit a downturn. Now we're getting into wars left and right. We're giving hundreds of billions of dollars to a country that isn't even doesn't even seem to be using the money for what it's designed for, right? You don't need hundreds of billions of dollars. And I think that's where the turnaround happens. That's where the youth are going to realize I'm graduating college with $200,000 in debt and there aren't any jobs. Or even if there are jobs, 
their pay, the, the, the pay and salaries that the jobs are offering you does not coincide with the rise, rising cost of living. So I think, I think the youth is waking up, maybe very slowly, but they're waking up. And there's a lot of political figures, especially the likes of Donald Trump. I know a lot of you guys don't like him, but he will be the nominee for this upcoming election in America. And boys are going to be an important one. But it's people like Trump that have been able to to run a dagger through the political chokehold on the youth by the left in the past few decades. So Constantine is right. We need to be more brave. We need to be more aware and determined to do the most important thing that we can. And that is to preserve our country, to preserve our values, to preserve the Constitution and our rights, because without it, we're done.